Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar on the topic of It Takes Two to Communicate. My name is Ann Lee Gilbert, and I'm the Senior Specialist of Programs and Online Education here at Candy Multiple Sclerosis, and I'm excited to be your moderator this evening. For those of you who might not be familiar with who we are, CANDU MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people who live with MS and for their support partners. Uh, we create programs, and through these programs, we empower people to manage their disease and to move beyond their MS by adopting healthy and active lifestyle behaviors. And you'll see a list of the programs that we offer here on your screen. Um, and you can find these uh, programs on our website and all of its descriptions at www.mscando.org. Um, you can uh, learn about our four-day flagship CANDO program that's held once a year in Denver. We also have our Take Charge program, which is our newest program. It's two and a half days, and that's done one to two times a year in different parts of the country. And then we have our one-day jumpstart program uh, that we do about five times a year. And then, of course, we have our webinar series. Um, so please uh, visit our website to find out more information about that. And in the next few weeks, we should have listed some um, upcoming dates and locations of where our programs will be in 2015. You can also connect with us on social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, like us, and you can get all kinds of up-to-date information regarding our upcoming programs and events. We're also on Twitter, so connect with us and you can receive all of our tweets about um, any recent happenings and events with CANDU. And we also have a YouTube channel, and here you can find all of our older webinar recordings um, and some fun videos uh, with CANDU MS staff and program participants. So be sure to check us out on social media. Uh, and before we get, um, before I introduce our uh, webinar presenters, I did want to go over just a few housekeeping issues. Uh, we'll save about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for your questions and answers. So if you do have a question, you'll notice that there's a chat feature located on the left bottom corner of your computer screen. And you can just chat in your question, type it in the little box, and hit send. And that is uh, where we will be able to see your questions. And um, we'll be able to address those questions um, at the end of the webinar. This presentation, it is being recorded, um, and uh, it will be archived on our website starting tomorrow afternoon, so you'll be able to revisit our website and um, view the presentation all over again. Um, and because this is being recorded, all of the telephone lines have been muted. And so I'd like to now uh, introduce our presenters for this evening's webinar. Here on your screen, you'll see uh, Beth Bullard. And Beth Bullard um, has practiced occupational therapy for over 25 years. Her area of expertise is adult neurological rehabilitation with a specialty in multiple sclerosis. She has been a member of our CANDU MS program staff for over 15 years, and she is now the Chief Operating Officer of Northern Colorado Rehabilitation Hospital. And here you see uh, Dr. Rosalind Kalb, and Ros Kalb is Vice President of Clinical Care at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, where she develops and provides educational materials, clinical tools, and consultation services for healthcare professionals. As a clinical psychologist in private practice, Ros provided individual, group, and family therapy for people living with MS for more than 25 years. Ros is a proud contributor to the Can Do MS Guide to Lifestyle Empowerment empowerment book published by Demos Health. And I'm so excited uh, to welcome our presenters, uh, Beth and Roz, and, and I'd like to now give it away to Roz. Uh, thanks very much. So I'm Roz Kalb, and I'm very excited to be here with Beth tonight to talk about communication. We're going to uh, start with Beth telling you how to set yourself up for success in your conversations. And then I'll uh, talk a bit about effective talking and listening. And after you've had a chance to listen to Beth and me for a couple of minutes to sort out our voices, we're actually going to do a, a role play um, of several common communication challenges. Um, so listen to us carefully so you can sort us out when we uh, put on our acting hats in a little while. Beth, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here this evening as well. When uh, two people communicate, they're really connecting, and those connections form our relationships. 
So it's very important to set us up for successful communications and successful relationships. Looking at the environment around us, how can we create a distractive free environment so that we can focus on what it is we're talking about? Understanding each other and respecting each other's feelings and their needs, being free from judgment. The other thing is understanding how we communicate and how we listen and how we learn. Some of us are more auditory, some of us are visual, and, and props in the conversation can be very helpful. Each one of us has our talents and our challenges. And whether it's because of um, multiple sclerosis or, or any other issue in our lives or just who we are, some of us struggle with um, remembering things as well. Or maybe that we don't attend to things or we get distracted easily. All of those things impact our ability to listen and to formulate what it is we're going to say. Uh, mood or having some anxiety about the conversation or maybe some anger that we're bringing in from somewhere else could be feelings that cloud our ability to be present in that conversation. So it's really important to, to put those aside and come clearly to this conversation um, with yourselves and your partner. Using strategies and tools that we have out there to make sure that we're functioning at our best, that we're our ideal selves when we go to have this conversation. When we look at creating the optimal environment, we really want to say, um, you know, my mother always says, oh, life is all about timing. And you think the timing is this magical thing and it's this wonderful time to talk. But, you know, timing is beautiful, but it isn't something that just happens and created. It's something that we plan for. So planning and committing to regular times to touch base and to talk. And when you talk about touching base, that may only be a 5 to 10 to 15 minute conversation. So you're going to set aside just a short amount of time just to check in. You may not have a lot to talk about, but you're acknowledging each other and you're asking that question. But when it's time to engage in a longer conversation, you're going to want to make sure that you have a longer period of time, be it 30 minutes or an hour, that you're going to commit to having those conversations. Looking at an area that's quiet, private, and comfortable, that seems um, so simple, but yet in our day-to-day -day lives it's so difficult because there's so many distractions that are created. Um, sitting across from each other, when you're talking about comfort, you need to have that eye contact. You need to be, as I say, on the same playing field. It's uncomfortable to have a conversation if one person is sitting and the other one is standing. It automatically puts you in, and for the person sitting, sort of this, uh, this person's overpowering me. How does that feel? It does, you're not coming together on an equal playing field. So making sure that you're, you're, you're sitting together, you're focusing on each other, and you have that eye contact. So much of what we say isn't what comes out of our mouths. It's the gestures we use. It's the eye contact. It's the facial expressions. And you need to have all of those things together so that you can adequately understand what that person's conveying and how it is that they're feeling. When we look at distractions, so many things. Each one of us is distracted in different ways. You may be someone who hears things and let's say it's a garbled speech from a room next door or a television that's on and that's very distracting or music. Or if it's a visual distraction, a lot of times if you're sitting near a window, there's cars going by or people going by. All those things can take our attention away for short periods of time or long, but it draws away from the conversation. So you want to make sure that those are limited. Um, other human beings that maybe don't need to be a part of the conversation, say you have children in the home. How do you create a spot where you move away? Um, I have children that are a little older now, but when they were younger and my husband and I wanted to have time together, we would cre have dinner in the dining room. And we made it fun for them and, and quiet for us in the sense that we gave them food on trays and we let them watch it from the TV. And I know that's not really the best thing to do, but it was a fun, special moment. And so we said we created an only adult bubble in the dining room and they couldn't break that adult barrier. And so they had their special time in there and we had our special time in here. And sometimes we'd even set the timer on the stove so that they knew they couldn't interrupt us until that timer went off. Um, the other one that I noticed that I didn't put on here is um, you can have canine or pet distractions. <laughs> I have two small dogs, and I was having a conversation with my husband last night, and often they're jumping in my lap and doing other things. And so they can be distracting as well and limiting um, them when you're trying to have a conversation. Appropriately unplugging. So many of us use our devices, our iPads, our droids, our, our phones. to um, There's helpful applications 
there's applications that help us record things so that we can remember them, uh, write down notes, save pictures so you can share ideas. All of those are helpful ways to use those tools, but all of the um, little bings and prompts and things that are coming in that may take us away from the importance of the discussion, that needs to go away. I know that um, in, in my work when I run a team, we kind of check our cell phones at the door and it, it's known everything has to go on mute because you're coming together to spend that quality time to connect. And it's not about what's happening to your phone or, or what you're, you're putting on your phone. It's definitely having those human interactions. So we've talked about creating the optimal environment. Now how do you enter that environment at your best? How do you create the optimal you? Each one of us has our own rhythm. Some of us are morning people. Some of us are night people. What's a good time of day that you tend to be at your freshest that you can plan that time to connect and to talk? Um, I don't know if you guys know that commercial. Uh, it's, about, it's for a candy bar, and basically um, this person's in a situation, and he's trying to talk to a group, and it's not going well, and someone taps him on the shoulder and hands him the candy bar, and he eats it, and then all of a sudden he turns out to be you know, fine in the person that he normally was. I think the tagline is, you're not you when you're hungry, and th that's certainly true. So your own body can distract you from the conversation if you're not adequately hydrated or adequately nourished, you're not hungry, so you make sure that those things are taken care of. Um, bring aids to help you communicate. If you're someone who maybe struggles to get the information across, if you have pictures of what it is you want to talk about, or maybe your partner is a visual person and needs that, that understanding uh, from a visual way. Do you have notes that help you communicate your thoughts and your ideas? I talked again about using um, some of the recording devices so that they can be helpful in the conversations. And those can be useful, but you need to make sure that both of you are in agreement to use those. Um, some people aren't comfortable having their conversations recorded. And we need to understand that they're being used for a positive reason. And I may say something to my spouse in that one conversation that says, you know, I really want to do this. But later, there's factors that come up that maybe change my mind about doing that. Well, I can't have him coming back to me say, look, I've got you on a recording, and you said you would do this. You know, life changes and conversations change, so we need to make sure that we're helpful and, and not at all hurting each other by um, using those devices. And most importantly, we need to approach every conversation with a positive, open mindset. You need to let go the worries of the day and what else may be going on. Clear your mind and enter that conversation and that time together in a mindful way. And now I'm going to turn it over to Roz. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to make your conversations with each other most successful. And conversations involve both talking and listening. So when you and your partner are having a conversation, um, it, it's really important to talk in ways that make it possible for the other person to hear and understand what you're saying. Um, so you might want to think ahead of time about what your key messages are. If you're concerned that you're not going to remember your key messages, you might, might want to make notes about them. Um, and it, um, as Beth mentioned, sometimes this kind of forgetfulness can happen because of cognitive issues caused by MS, or you may be feeling anxious about the conversation or about things that you want to bring up. Whatever uh, reason may be causing it to be difficult to think about what you want to say, these little notes can be very helpful. It's also important to make eye contact with your partner. Um, because that's a way to make sure that you're really talking to that other person and that the other person is hearing what you have to say. Um, I saw that somebody had jotted down a question in the chat box about what happens if you can't be on exactly the same level. One of you has to sit down perhaps because of the MS. The other has to stand because of back issues. So sitting for a long time is uncomfortable. I think you can make adjustments so that kind of thing, as long as you understand why one of you is sitting and one of you is standing and that you agree that that's okay, because you can still make eye contact. Um, and it's that eye contact that really helps you feel connected while you're talking. 
I think it's important to start conversations, particularly important ones about important topics, from a positive place. Because a lot of research about relationships and communication has shown that most conversations actually end where they start. So if you start off angry, hostile, resentful, chances are no matter how long you talk, you may end up in that same place. So if you start um, from a more positive place, open to what the other person has to say, ready to think about how to come to agreement and find some compromises, you'll find that you end up in that more positive place as well. Generally, it's a good idea to start conversations with an I statement. Um, when you point your finger at somebody and say, you will do this and you do that and you're the problem, all that happens is that you put that other person on the defensive. You sort of back them into a corner and all they can do is feel like they have to fight back. That if you start your statements with I think or I wish, or I feel, or I would like to ask you, then you're just talking about where you are, what you're feeling, and what you need, and that allows the other person to respond. Now, I have given talks about this at some of our can-do programs, and I've talked about the importance of I statements, and somebody did point out that it's cheating um, to say something like, well, I feel you're a jerk. That does not count as a positive I statement. We're really talking about respectful um, statements beginning with I um, in which you make a request or express a feeling to the other person. Now it's particularly important to give the person you're talking to time to think and respond. Now if it's a sensitive topic or a controversial topic, either one of you may have difficulty formulating your thoughts and your responses, figuring out how you feel about what your partner is saying. So it's always a good idea um, to make sure that you're giving the other person time to think and respond. If your partner has cognitive issues caused by MS, it may mean that that person actually needs extra time because if they're processing information more slowly than they used to, it can take quite a bit of time for him or her to um, hear what's being said, think it through, think about what the answer might be. So it's not stalling. It's not not wanting to respond. It's not not caring about what you're saying. It's actually taking that extra time to to process the information and formulate a response. So if you um, rush in and get impatient or get angry at the person for not responding quickly, you're actually going to slow it down even further. So it's very important to pace your conversation so that the other person, particularly if he or she has cognitive issues, um, has time to think about what, saying, what you're saying and come back with a response. It's equally important to listen so that your partner will feel comfortable talking to you. If you um, jump in and interrupt or finish the other person's sentence, you're not conveying that you truly care about what your partner is saying. Now, if your partner is um, uh, talking more slowly or responding more slowly or thinking more slowly than, than you would like, you need to bear in mind that the topic may be something that's of concern or causing some anxiety, and that might slow down what he or she is saying. Or if your partner has cognitive issues, again, formulating their thoughts, putting them into um, sentences to communicate with you may take longer than you would like. But when you jump in to interrupt or try to finish the sentence, all that does is distract your partner, to, which makes it even harder for the conversation to happen. 
try not to jump to conclusions about what your partner is thinking or going to say. Um, no matter how much we love or care about another person, we can't know what's going on uh, in his or her mind. So when you jump to conclusions, you're not allowing your partner um, the time and space to say exactly what's of concern. And be careful to watch your body language. You know, when you uh, look away or you focus on that cell phone that you should have turned off before the conversation started, or you're watching television while your partner is trying to have this conversation with you, or let's say you're rolling your eyes or twiddling your thumbs or fidgeting in your chair, that body language conveys a lot of feelings. So you want to make sure that your body language is showing respect, interest, concern, um, attention, right? Um, and I think our body language gives us away a lot, and so it's something to really focus on when you're trying to have um, a, an effective conversation with one another. It's important to acknowledge and confirm what you've heard. When you do this, it demonstrates to the other person that you really have been paying attention, that you care what he or she is saying, and that you're thinking about what has been said and formulating a response. And if, as you're listening, if you're dealing with your own cognitive issues where you're having trouble processing the information or remembering what your partner is saying, then acknowledging and confirming what you've heard is a great way to make sure that you're actually getting the key message. Lots of times uh, misunderstandings occur um, simply because people haven't taken the time to make sure they've understood what's been said. So this back and forth of acknowledging what's said, confirming, maybe repeating the main points out loud is a way to make sure that you're actually getting your messages across to one another. And listening is an active process. It's not passive. It's not just sitting back and um, sort of waiting for it to be over. It's really focusing on what the person is saying, thinking about it, trying to understand it, asking questions if you don't understand or asking for clarification if you're having difficulty understanding the point your partner is trying to make. If, if while you're listening, you're busy formulating your comeback or your uh, criticism or your angry retort, you're not really listening. You're, you're thinking more about how you're feeling and what you want to say than what your partner is trying to tell you. So again, the way to test whether you're listening, really listening, would be to acknowledge and confirm what you've heard and make sure that you get that um, affirmation from your partner that, that you've really understood what he or she was trying to say. So with those tips, um, I think we'd like to try and do some role playing. We hope now that you've heard our voices um, and been able to figure out who's who here. Um, but again, I'm uh, Roz Kalb, and I am in these little vignettes that we're going to do. I will always be playing the husband. And Beth, say hello. Yeah, this is Beth, and I will always <laughs> be playing the wife. Great. So in this first vignette, we are going to be working at resolving a conflict, a common conflict that many of us have about how to find time together but also find that good balance which allows us each to have some time alone. Um, so I'm going to start, and I'm going to say to my wife, I'd really like to talk something over with you. I know you're exhausted now, but what would be a good time for you for us to have this conversation? You know, just let me rest a few minutes and then we can talk. Okay. Um, I know that I've been a little cranky lately, and 
I've been thinking a lot about why this might be and what I could do about it. And, I, you know, I think with my really crazy work schedule and all the stuff I'm doing around here now, I've really lost all my time for myself. I used to have a lot, and now I just, I just don't have any. And you know I get grumpy when I don't get enough exercise or don't get time to putter around in the yard or the garage. And Could we please brainstorm a little about how I could build in a little of that time just for me? Oh, great. Now you're crying. What's that all about? Why are you crying? Well, it it feels like you don't want to be with me. You know, I'm alone all the time as it is. And sometimes when you're here, you're not really here connecting with me or the kids the way that you did. And now you want to be away more? You know, i got to tell you, that's really hard for me to hear. It's not that I don't want to be with you. That's not what I meant. It's it's that I want to be a better me when I'm with you, and I don't want to be cranky and distant all the time. But that's how I'm I'm feeling, which is why I want to talk about this. Maybe I just need a little time between work and all the craziness that goes on there, and then time with you. I, I need some time to change gears and and relax just a little bit. I have a lot of chores to do as soon as I walk in the house. And it's feeling like going from one full-time job to another full-time job. And I'm just having trouble with that. Well, you know, I can do more around here than you allow me to do. You're so worried all the time that you've taken over everything, even things I could probably do very well myself, if maybe we just made a few changes around the house. You know, I'm sure the occupational therapist I saw last week could help us with that. Um, but you need to give me the space to do it. You need to give me the space to try. Wouldn't it be great if we could enjoy time together rather than spending it all on household tasks or taking care of me? I can take care of me. Well, I'm okay with that as long as we can figure out how you can do things more safely so I don't have to worry about you all the time. Um, but. I still need you to be okay with my having some time that's just for me. Can we talk about that? Well, you know, I guess having more of my own things to do while you're not here would make me feel purposeful, and it would be easier for me to give you that time and space to be away because I wouldn't be just waiting. I would be busy. Um, When do you think you'd like to have that time? Maybe um, I could use it to do something special on my own or with a girlfriend, do something that maybe you don't necessarily enjoy but I do. Well, maybe a couple of hours on Saturday afternoon to go to the gym or do something with a buddy. I mean, that would feel really good. But I'd also like to just be able to take about 20 minutes when I get home from work, I don't know, take a shower, watch the news, something in order to wind down before dealing with dinner. Wow, Uh, this would be a big change, and you know how much I really love change. makes me nervous. But maybe I could plan something on my own for Saturday afternoons while you're out. You know, I think Y has a class that I might like, and my friend Helen was asking me to do that. So um, that's, that's good. And, you know, maybe I could do some of the dinner prep during the day, So there's not as much to do when you come in the door, um, and there aren't chores waiting for you, and that would give you that 20 minutes of time. Well, that sounds great to me. Um, Why don't we try it for a couple of weeks and then talk again about how it's going, and maybe I won't be so cranky. (laughs) That would be great, honey. Okay, our next vignette is about making a request. Um, oftentimes we, we see our, our partners and we see opportunities or tools that they could use that could make their life um, a little safer and potentially easier, um, but it's a difficult thing to discuss. And so what we wanted to do is go through a vignette about asking your partner to use a mobility aid. And again, I am the wife, and Rods will be um, the husband. 
you know, honey, could we take a minute to talk? Remember how we saw that scooter last week at the MS meeting? I was thinking that you and the kids and I could do so many more things together if we had one of those. I don't want to talk about that. I don't need it. And, you know, the more I walk, the longer I'm going to be able to walk, you know, use it or lose it. I, I'm just not ready to talk about that. Well, come on, just just hear me out. Here's what I think it would do for you and for the family. It's hard to take the kids to the zoo or to the museum because it's so exhausting for you. By the time we get there, you're too pooped to enjoy it. And when you're pooped, you're more likely to trip and fall, which means the kids and I are always worried about your safety, and we can't enjoy ourselves either. We'd rather enjoy what we're doing than worrying about you. Well, stop worrying so much. It's all fine. Well, you know what? Actually, it isn't fine. We could be doing so much more as a family and loving every minute of it if we knew you were comfortable and safe. And besides, you know how we used to love taking walks together in the evenings, just the two of us? Well, it's kind of hard now because if I walk my normal pace, I'm way ahead of you. But if I try to slow down, it's more exhausting than you think. You know, I really miss our walking and talking together. If I use a scooter, I'll stop being able to walk. I need that exercise. Well, I'm not talking about using the scooter all the time. Just for long distances to save your energy and to keep you safe and enjoy those activities. It's not like you're going to be glued to it. You can get out and walk whenever you want to. Go to the gym to exercise. You know, I'll bet the physical therapist would say that using a scooter some of the time would be fine as long as you're doing your planned exercises like she recommended and going to the gym. You know, why don't we ask her? Well, I hadn't really thought about how my using a scooter sometimes would help you and the kids. Let, let me think about this a bit. It takes a little getting used to, um, but I'll talk to my physical therapist next time, and then I guess we could talk about this again. But, you know, this is a really hard step for me to take. I know. I know how hard and painful it is to you to think about doing things differently than before. But I really want you to know how much the kids and I want you to keep doing as much as possible with us as a family. Okay. So our next vignette is um, talking about managing a challenge, keeping the relationships balanced in the faces of change. Life is all about change. Um, and we're going to do a vignette around that. Again, I'm the wife, and Roz is the husband. I'm glad we're sitting down to have you know, this conversation. You know, since we have this little downtime right now, there's really something that's been on my mind, and, and I, I want to talk to you about it. Uh-oh. What's up now? Well, we've both been concerned about our finances since you retired. My job is good, but I've been offered an opportunity to apply for a job with more money, but it does come with longer hours, and I wanted to talk this over with you. You're already doing everything for the family. Pretty soon I won't have anything to contribute. What do you need me for? This feels awful. Pretty soon you'll decide I'm not much use to you anymore, certainly not much use to myself. Hey, not so fast. If I'm working more hours... I'm going to have to rely on you to pick up the slack around here. We need to be a team to make this all work, so stop talking about being useless. What do you mean? I can't do anything like I used to, and most of the stuff you do, I don't have a clue about anyway. Well, you know, I don't believe that stuff about old dogs and new tricks. I think you could help out a lot with what I do around here. Like, for instance, being like with the... what, for instance? Oh, Sorry. Sorry. Being with the kids after school to help with their homework, getting start, the st started dinner, get the laundry done. Um, take, we'll take the responsibilities of folding it on our own, but you can get it started. Can we talk about the cleaning and figure out what maybe a job chart so the kids can help? Each one of us will have our tasks, and it will be shared by everybody. Whoa, I can't even keep all this straight. Well, I remember you used to work in management. It's 
It's just about managing a house and kids, just like you did at work. It's easy. We can do the, get the tools together to do it. Yeah, but my clients were a lot easier than my wife and kids. Well, i got to agree with you there. I'm a little worried about that, too. But I'll be sad not to have as much time with the kids. But, you know, we've managed through changes in the past, and we'll manage this now as long as we're able to talk about it and work with it together. It means a lot to me that you'll be the, be there for the family. Pretty scary, huh? Yeah, it's really important to our relationship that we feel like partners, that we each contribute and we feel good about the way we're managing things. What if I can't do it all? I mean, I get really tired, you know, like I'm tired when I get up. Well, maybe we could ask for a referral to an occupational therapist who can come to the house. Help us figure out how to get better organized, how to do these chores easier. Help us feel like how to delegate to the kids so things are less tiring to you and easier to manage. Okay, let's give it a shot. I'm ready. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so for our last vignette, we're going to talk about how to make a plan, how to take each other's needs into account and have a backup. And again, I'm going to be the husband and Beth is going to be the wife. And what we're talking about is making a plan for the holidays, because of course all of us are um, starting to think about how we're going to manage the busy holiday season. So, honey, it's time to think about the holidays coming up. You know, we've always hosted everyone. Do we still want to do that? Well, yeah, it's what we've always done. Besides, who else might host it if we don't do it? Well, I'm okay with this, but I know how tired you get, and the kitchen is hot, and there's so much food to prepare and cleaning to do. We we have to do this differently than we've done it in the past, or it's not going to work. So let's think about how we're going to go about this. You know what? I've got it. I'll just rest the day before. Then I know I can do it. I can do it all. Well, well... Resting the day before is important, but it's not enough. I mean, I think we need to think about the whole week or months before. Like, we need to start now so you can actually enjoy yourself when everybody's here. Well, how much beforehand can we clean a house with five people living in it? Well, the kids can help, and we can do that the week before. As long as you guys agree to not mess it up. Hmm. How about we start thinking about the food and the gifts now, not waiting till the last minute like we always do. And I know you like to cook the whole deal, but that isn't just, it's just not going to work. I mean, it's too much, and we have to think of a different plan. So what are your absolute favorite things to prepare for Christmas dinner? And we'll get other people to do the rest. Well, you know, I love it all, I must admit, but, you know, I really wanted to do the turkey. I like doing the main dish. And then, of course, love the desserts. So I think those would be the two I'd pick. You know, I could grill the turkey, and you could work on the stuffing, and that way the kitchen doesn't get so hot, and that would make you much more comfortable so you could uh, deal with your desserts as much as you want. You know, that is a great idea because the heat of the oven and the heat of the house does make me tired. Um, and the kids and I, could help, they could help me make the desserts because, you know, they're always into the sweet stuff. And I've got some great recipe ideas that don't take a lot, don't take any baking. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's try that. You know, I really like the idea of getting the kids involved because this really feels like a team that's good for us and it's good for them to feel part of that. Um, so, Maybe we could all sit down together with a bunch of catalogs and start ordering presents for the relatives now. I'm sure the kids would get into that. Wow, this is starting to feel like a plan. Um, Why don't we write down a little schedule for ourselves with all the stuff that needs to get done by, let's say, mid-December. This could make the holidays so less stressful and more enjoyable because we're doing it as a team. Great idea. 
Well, now that you've seen Beth's and my fabulous acting skills, um, we wonder if you have any comments about these conversations or questions or even tips that you want to share um, with others on the call about ways that you've handled some of these challenging conversations. Well, excellent. Well, thanks, uh, Roz and Beth. I did not realize that drama was part of your repertoire, your resume, <laughs> but that was a lot of fun. Um, we didn't either. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, please feel free to everyone chat in any comments that you have, questions, tips that you've um, found along the ways of communicating with your um, loved ones, um, and, and we'll share those. But we did get a few questions throughout the webinar, and we do also have some questions that we received um, from folks who have registered from the program. And um, here's our first question. They ask, how can I best get my wife to understand that my forgetfulness and slow responses to our communication is a result of cognitive loss from my MS? Well, let me take a stab at that. I'm sure that um, Beth will have something to add as well. But I think um, the best way to do that is to talk about it. Um, you know, I think that the cognitive changes that happen in MS can be hard for people to understand, particularly in the heat of a difficult conversation. And so I think it's important to make sure that you explain um, the kinds of changes that you're experiencing. And if you have difficulty um, with those explanations, um, the National MS Society has very good materials that you can share that talk about the different ways that MS can affect cognition. Um, and, and then I think it's important when you're running into difficulties, like you're having trouble keeping up with the conversation or remembering what you want to say, that you just stop and say that and explain what's happening and tell your wife what it is that you need her to understand about what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think as much as you can kind of put some real, reality into how they're thinking, what the specifics is. You can say, well, I have cognitive problems, but getting down to the specifics about what it is, as Roz was talking about, is it a memory issue? Do I have trouble paying attention? Um, speech language pathologists are wonderful clinicians that work with individuals who have cognitive problems, and it might be nice to have um, that person evaluate the specific issues that you're having, talk with you about those, and then they can bring your spouse in and um, they can put her through a series of things that will help her understand what it is. It, they have a neat way of um, doing some little strategies and scenarios and tests that even um, that they could do with her that would demonstrate how it is you may be feeling or thinking and where the barriers are, and, and she may have a, a better appreciation of it after she's gone through a session like that. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, we we had uh, someone comment that, you know, when um, going into a conversation um, with someone that it always helps to start with a positive statement um, or a compliment um, to just start the conversation off on a, with a positive outlook. And I think that's, that's a great tip to share, so thanks for that. Um, and we have um, another comment here. Um, someone mentioned that, you know, communication, while, you know, we communicate probably most with our partners, that communication can also be with our boss or our subordinate or coworkers and friends um, in other scenarios. And so we did have a question from someone that came in um, um, about, you know, communicating with their employer. And so they're asking, um, you know, how do I effectively communicate with my employer about my health issues or my MS when, um, you know, for the very first time or suppose if we're embarrassed to talk about it? How would we communicate that to our employer? This is Roz. I mean, I think it, it's a, it's, that's a very complex question, and it certainly depends on whether this is a first-time conversation about your MS or a follow-up conversation after you've already disclosed to your employer that you have MS. If you haven't disclosed yet, I think it's very, very important to get educated about um, what are the implications of disclosing in the workplace and make sure you know the ways that the 
Americans with Disabilities Act protects you in the workplace. So you really want to get as educated as possible about um, what your rights are before you decide uh, when to disclose, what person in your workplace to disclose to, and what to say. Um, once you've made the disclosure about your MS, usually because you want to ask for an accommodation of some kind in your workplace, then I think the strategy is that you explain that you have a disability. There's nothing in the law that requires you to say that you have multiple sclerosis, but you do need to be able to um, share some note from your physician that you have a disability that makes it necessary for you to ask for a particular accommodation in the workplace. And generally, the way to communicate it is to say that you, you have a disability and that this, the following accommodations that you're requesting would help you to be more, uh, more productive, more effective as an employee. So what we refer to it as the win-win approach to accommodations. You're really letting the employer know that you are proactively making suggestions of accommodations that would help you uh, be better as an employee in whatever work that you're in. And if um, after that point, maybe there's some changes that need to happen to the work environment, be it a desk set up, something with a computer, or, or how things are set up as far as the distance between your office and a bathroom. Those are all things that you can work through an occupational therapist. They actually can do a work site evaluation and work alongside your employer to make those accommodations, which are very simple. They're not costly, and it, it makes it successful um, for everyone. And, you know, as as a, a manager or a boss or a leader in a hospital, it's or well, I say hospital because I work in one. <laughs> it's our job to um, make make our employees successful and find the ways to remove obstacles for their success. And so that's the energy that your human resources department and your managers um, should bring to that table to help you be successful in your role. Great, thank you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very sensitive um, topic, but, but we appreciate the question. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people have that question. Um, so we have uh, another question here. Um, what are some techniques I can learn to recognize when my partner and I are headed towards an argument so we can be able to avoid falling into that argument? I think body language is a great uh, clue to what's going on. And you can tell if your own... Uh, body is tensing up and you're feeling um, angrier and angrier, chances are um, your reactions are mirroring your partner's. Um, and I, I, I think one of the best things to do is actually have a conversation with, with one another about how to handle it when that happens. It's okay to be angry. No one says that you have to go through life or deal with the challenges of MS without getting angry. I think the trick is to be able to talk about the anger rather than just expressing it. Um, it's talking about the way you feel and the kinds of things that are making you angry so that you begin to problem solve around them. There's a big difference between doing that and just shouting your anger at somebody. Mm -hmm. And when you're feeling that tense body, and I think uh, you're hearing the conversation tone rise, and it's becoming uncomfortable for you and for the other person, to to have some sort of unspoken little sign language that we say, you know what, we got to stop. Let's stop, dial it back, um, and then come back to the conversation. Yeah. You know, I think that's a great suggestion, Beth, and I think that it's that it's an okay thing to do. It's all right to call a timeout and say, you know, we're not really getting anywhere. We're both just getting really hot under the collar. Can we take a break for 10 minutes or can we take a break until tomorrow when we've had a chance to rest and think about it and come back with a positive suggestion that we want to make? Because chances are when the tension's building up and you're just getting angrier and angrier, you're not going to get to a good resolution anyway so you might as well talk each 
to each other about how to take a temporary break from the conversation as long as you have a commitment to come back to it and try and reach resolution soon. Absolutely. We actually just had a um, a uh, participant on the webinar or a viewer comment that before you open your mouth, remember to just breathe first. <laughs> Um, and I think Great sometimes suggestion. we can, yeah, we can sometimes get ahead of ourselves and and kind of just speak out of turn without even realizing what's being said because we're so we, heated. But so. yeah, we, you know, I mean, obviously tensions happen not just in relationships at home and partnerships, obviously in workplaces and everywhere else. And um, we always like to give it the 24-hour rule at work. Um, you know, if something's really upsetting and it's it's but it's not vital to any operation thing. It's like let's take a break put it in perspective, go home and sleep on it, and then come back to the conversation when you're at a different point in thinking through that because then you can, can address that coworker or your boss or somebody else from a more mindful perspective place than from a place of, um, of frustration and anger. Um, okay, um, let's see, our next question. Um, this person says that, you know, that she says, I have a tendency to interrupt people when they're talking. I don't mean to be rude to them, but when I have a thought in my head, I don't want to forget it, so I have to say it at that time, at that moment. How can I improve on this? <laughs> I have that same problem. <laughs> <laughs> I get excited about sharing things and um, and wanting to be part of that conversation. But when that happens, you can't overpower the other individual, and they may have something to share that you really didn't want to miss. But sometimes what I'll do is I keep little notes and pencils, and I'll write it down. So I write the idea down so I don't lose it, but then I've kind of taken that out of my mind, and I can go back and actively listen to what that person's saying until it's my turn to talk. Um, I think that's a, a, a really good idea um, to have a, a little notepad, um, like Beth said. Also, when we had um, a communications workshop at a recent Can Do program, um, one of the um, people, one of the participants at the program, said that sometimes when she's in a conversation with her husband and, and she really has something that she feels she needs to say, and she's so afraid she's going to forget it. She has actually said, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just say one thing so that you'll know that I want to come back to this and you'll help me remember? So she was able to ask him to help her with that. So it was a brief interruption, but it was also sort of a partnership <laughs> Uh, solution to it so that he could then help her remember what she wanted to respond when when he was done. And, and I thought that that was a nice way to handle it too. Great. Um, we just got another question in, um, in this. They ask, uh, is there a good way to explain to, um, is there a good way to explain um, someone's MS to younger children, perhaps you know, kids who are in grade school or younger who might not fully understand it or the disease? Um, I think that MS is a, is a complex disease that, that is difficult to understand. One of the um, tools that I, I really recommend is um, something called Keep Smiling. Um, Keep like K E E P and then S apostrophe M Y E L I N. It's a, a publication from the National MS Society for Young Kids, um, and it's available online or in print um, for kids. You know, about ages um, I don't know five to twelve. Although I've heard that older kids kind of sneak it sometimes because they think it's so much fun. Um, but it, it has, you know, information about MS uh, in a, at an age level that's, you know, that's appropriate for, for young kids, simple vocabulary. It uh, has stories and games. It makes it sort of fun and interesting. So it's a wonderful publication for parents and kids to share with one another or for grandparents to share with young kids about MS. Um, so if you go to the National MS Society website and, and search on Keep Smiling, you can just order it and it will be sent free um, 
to the child or to you so that you can share it with the child. Great. Thanks, Ross, for that resource. Um, the National MS Society has a ton, a plethora of resources um, for different things. So yeah, remember to just go to their website to see you know, what else they might have to offer for things that you might need. Um, we got another question here. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, they ask, and, and I actually received this question quite a, a, a number of times through the registration process. And they ask, how do you ask your mate or your partner or your friend to help you without sounding bossy? <laughs> I don't know. I still struggle with that one. I don't know. I ask people to help me all the time. I hope I don't sound bossy. <laughs> You know, I think for me it's the difference between making a request and ordering somebody around. It's, you know, this is something I'm having difficulty doing, and I'd like to ask your help with it. Um, when I think it becomes bossy is when you ask somebody to do something for you or that you can't do yourself and then complain about the way they do it. Um, and I, you know, I, it's, it's sort of a classic situation that I've heard from a lot of um, women, usually with MS, who are used to keeping their um, houses very neat and clean. And so at some point, maybe their symptoms of MS make it difficult for them to do things around the house the way they used to. So they ask for help from their spouse and children, and then can't bear it because their spouse and children just don't do it right. Um, and so I think it, your impatience or your, um, um, I don't know, dissatisfaction with the way other people may help you with things can come across as bossiness. So I think it's just important to ask um, when you need assistance or, or help with something or you want someone to do something and explain how they they can do it, and then you have to let them do it the way they can. Um, and that's the best way to avoid coming across as being bossy. Yes, I agree, Roz. I, it's, it's good not to, to demand or direct and expect, but to, to say, hey, I, I really need help with this, and giving them a little bit, and this is why. You know, it's difficult for my balance when I do this. Could you help me with this one particular thing? And then the nice thing is you can come back and say, well, what can I help you with? And, and that way it's a give and take. The, the other part of that I think is that sometimes when you can't do something yourself, the, the, the tendency is to, to be frustrated and impatient. And so you want the other person to help you do it, but you also have to allow that other person time and space. They, they may be busy doing something of their own or occupied. So unless it's an emergency, they may say, sure, I'm happy to help. Um, I'll be there in a few minutes. And so you, you, you have to allow that time for the other person so that they don't always feel interrupted in whatever they're doing, like they have to drop what they're doing right away just so you won't be annoyed. Yeah, I agree. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and this person says that she and her husband uh, love to travel, but it's difficult for her to travel with her MS. Um, she wants him to continue to see places, you know, even sometimes without her. Um, but, you know, whenever she suggests this, he feels bad leaving her. And so she wants him to understand that it sometimes even hurts her worse if he doesn't go because, um, because of her. So, you know, how can, she help to, how can she help her husband understand that it's okay to do things without her sometimes? Well, I think that's a very nice message that she's trying to give her husband. And he may feel very guilty um, about doing things that are difficult for her. So I have a few suggestions. One is to make sure that as a couple, they're really making the optimal use of assistive devices and tools to make sure that they are doing as many things together as they can comfortably do and enjoy safely. Um, so that she's not giving up more things than she needs to. 
if there are things that she really cannot do or doesn't enjoy doing but wants him to enjoy, the best way to send a spouse or partner off to enjoy um, himself is to make sure that he knows that you're doing something that you enjoy at the same time. So just like in our vignette about time together and time alone, I've found that spouses feel a lot less guilty about going off to do something if they know that the person they care about is also doing something enjoyable and fun. So maybe that's a way to plan so that nobody has to feel guilty or resentful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for us. Um, Well, I think that's all the time that we have uh, for questions now. Um, And so for those of you who... um, if we, if we weren't able to address your question, I'm so, so sorry, but um, you, we do have um, what's called Ask the Can Do Team, and it's one of our resources that you can find on our website at www.mscandu.org. Um, and if you just look for our Ask the Can Do Team page, um, you can submit your question that wasn't answered there, or any question that you might have, whether it's on communication or another topic. Um, and we will forward those to our programs consultants, and we'll be sure that um, they will get answered for you. And um, we'll reply back to you as soon as we can. So if, if you did have a question we weren't able to address it, please remember to visit our website, um, and we'll certainly get you in touch with one of our programs consultants. Um, and just to mention a few of our other resources that we have, um, now that you're part of our Can Do MS team by being a participant on this webinar, um, you'll receive our monthly e-newsletter It's a newsletter that you'll get in your email about any upcoming events, any upcoming programs, um, some fun stories from program participants, um, and those will get to you in our email, but they're also saved on our website. So if you want to look through our past e-news letters, then you can just visit our website. And we also have what's called our Can Do Library, and um, this library is comprised of all kinds of, you know, short articles written by our programs consultants on um, a variety of different topics. So um, if you're just looking for some reading material or have questions um, about you know, anything that you are dealing with with your MS, just go through our library and you might be able to um, find something to help you out. And before I uh, announce what our next um, December webinar topic is, I did want to say that Can Do MS has um, announced our 2015 dates and locations for our Vertical Express event. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Vertical Express is our on-mountain ski fundraiser um, that we do every year, and it takes place on four different mountains. And uh, next year, it'll be in February and March, starting in Vail, Colorado on February 21st, and then we'll be at Crystal Mountain, Washington, Uh, on the 28th, and then in Schweitzer, Idaho on March 7th, and then we'll be finishing up in Squaw Valley, California on March 14th. Um, If you are in any of those areas and you're interested in participating as a fundraiser, um, we will have a registration open next week and you'll receive an email about it. Um, Another fun thing that we're introducing this year with Vertical Express is adaptive skiing, Um, and we'll be having it on three mountains this year along with the event. We'll have adaptive ski skiing in Vail, at Crystal Mountain and in Squaw Valley. And this is where um, people with MS will have the chance to ski with adaptive ski equipment and get one-on-one instruction with a professional ski instructor. So if any of you are interested in participating in in these events, um, please um, just keep a lookout in your email, and there will be an application to apply to be a part of the ski experience if you are interested. Um, And so we we have a lot of fun things coming up, and and we're always excited to get our programs participants uh, involved in our events. And so our next webinar is going to be on December 9th. It's going to be at the same time at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And the topic is Holistic Tips to Healthy Eating and Exercise. Um, and our speakers are Eliza ben Zachariah, who is a nurse uh, practitioner as well as a nutritionist, and Amy Dix, who is um, our, our physician assistant. Um, and so please join us from the convenience of your home or office or wherever you are. I'm at no charge to you. And for those participating tonight, 
once this is over, you'll see a survey appear on your computer screen. And we would so appreciate if you could take a moment to complete that survey and share your input. Your feedback um, always helps us to improve our webinars. Um, and um, so we, we value um, what you have to say. Um, and also, you will receive a copy of tonight's webinar slides in your email this evening, um, and so you can look over those. And again, a recording of this webinar will be available on the website uh, tomorrow afternoon. So uh, thank you again to Dr. Kalb and to uh, Beth. We really appreciate you spending your Monday evening with us. And thanks for everyone who's joined us tonight. We hope you all have a great evening.